Providing energy for muscle contraction is the topic of this screencast. This topic may be found in Chapter 6 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Explain why ATP is required for skeletal muscle fiber contraction. Describe the sources of ATP for skeletal muscle fiber contraction. Explain oxygen debt. List the components and explain the fate of lactic acid after exercise ceases. And explain muscle fatigue. ATP is required in order for muscle cells to contract. ATP is used to run the sodium potassium pumps, which maintain the resting membrane potentials of the skeletal muscle fibers. And these pumps have to continue to run in order to move sodium out of the cell and potassium inside the cell since every time an action potential is generated in a skeletal muscle fiber, sodium floods in and potassium moves out. ATP is also used to release the myosin heads from the thin filaments and re-cock or reposition them for reattachment. In the absence of ATP, a muscle will simply fail to contract even though it may be stimulated with acetylcholine from a motor neuron. And this is termed fatigue. So let's now look at where skeletal muscle fibers obtain their ATP to support muscle fiber contraction. To understand where skeletal muscle fibers obtain ATP, let's say that you decided to jog or run for 10 minutes. So you start jogging. Initially, your skeletal muscle fibers would obtain energy from the ATP stored in the sarcoplasm. However, your skeletal muscle cells only have four to six seconds worth of ATP stored in the sarcoplasm. So after the initial four to six seconds of jogging or running, other sources of ATP must be found by the skeletal muscle cells. After ATP stores are depleted by the skeletal muscle fibers, creatine phosphate in the cytoplasm or sarcoplasm of the skeletal muscle fibers can provide a source of ATP. Creatine phosphate transfers a phosphate to ADP to regenerate ATP stores in the sarcoplasm. However, creatine phosphate only supplies about 15 seconds worth of ATP. After stored ATP and ATP regenerated by creatine phosphate are depleted, ATP is obtained by the skeletal muscle cell from these two processes shown here. Glycolysis is shown in the yellow panel on the left and occurs in the cytoplasm. Because glycolysis does not require oxygen, it is often referred to as anaerobic respiration. In glycolysis, glucose 6-phosphate is used to make ATP. Glucose 6-phosphate is either obtained from blood glucose or from glycogen stores in the sarcoplasm, which are broken down to release gly glucose, which is then converted to glucose 6-phosphate. In glycolysis, glucose 6-phosphate is converted to pyruvate, and in the process, two to three ATP molecules are formed. Again, no oxygen is used in the production of these two to three ATP molecules. The pyruvate is then moved into the mitochondrion and there a complex series of reactions which requires oxygen converts the pyruvate to 30 ATP molecules, carbon dioxide, and water. Because oxygen is required for this process, it is referred to as aerobic respiration. Most ATP produced by cells, and the whole body for that matter, is produced by aerobic respiration in the mitochondria. 
This is why the body needs a constant supply of oxygen and also why the body is constantly producing carbon dioxide, which must be removed from the body. Aerobic respiration is much more efficient than anaerobic respiration or glycolysis. 30 ATP molecules are produced for every glucose molecule compared to 2 to 3 ATP uh, in glycolysis. However, aerobic respiration is a slower process and requires oxygen. If enough ATP cannot be supplied by aerobic respiration, possibly due to the lack of uh, oxygen, then additional ATP can be formed by glycolysis. In this situation, you can get more pyruvate produced than the mitochondrion can use. And so you get a buildup of pyruvic acid, which can uh, cause problems because pyruvate or pyruvic acid is an acid and it can drop the pH of the cell. So the pyruvate may be temporarily converted to lactic acid. Lactic acid is also an acid and potentially can drop the pH of the skeletal muscle fiber. Lactic acid is responsible for that burning sensation that you feel when you work a muscle that you haven't worked for some time. And lactic acid can also contribute to muscle fatigue. So let's review where our skeletal muscles obtained ATP in order to power contraction for our 10 minute run. So initially our first four to six seconds of ATP was obtained from stores in the cytoplasm. Then the next 15 seconds of ATP were obtained from creatine phosphate regenerating ATP from ADP. And then from 20 seconds on until the end of exercise, ATP was obtained from glycolysis and aerobic respiration. Now, I want you to note that aerobic respiration requires oxygen, and it takes some time for the lungs and the heart to supply the oxygen to the skeletal muscle cells in order to make ATP. So that a the ATP stores and the ATP regenerated from creatine phosphate provides energy for that initial 15 to 20 seconds while increased oxygen is being brought to the skeletal muscle cells by the lungs and by the heart. Now, after aerobic respiration is initiated and starts providing ATP for muscle contraction, depending on the demand for ATP versus how much is supplied by aerobic respiration, some lactic acid will be temporarily formed whenever there's not enough ATP produced by aerobic means. So the larger the difference between the ATP requirement for sustained muscle contraction and the amount that can be supplied by aerobic respiration, the more lactic acid will be generated. Do you ever wonder why after you stop exercising, your respiration and heart rates remain elevated? This is to repay the oxygen debt that was created during exercise. Some of that oxygen debt includes replenishing the oxygen levels in the lungs and also the blood that were reduced during exercise. Another component of oxygen debt is the buildup of lactic acid. So when sufficient ATP to support exercise could not be produced by aerobic respiration, the difference was made up through anaerobic respiration. This resulted in a buildup of pyruvic acid and that pyruvic acid was temporarily converted to lactic acid. Lactic acid is an acid. It potentially can reduce the pH of the skeletal muscle fiber. And so now that lactic acid needs to be converted to pyruvic acid and used to make ATP. Now that vigorous exercise has ceased, that lactic acid is converted back to pyruvate, and then that pyruvate is moved into the mitochondrion, and oxygen is used to convert that pyruvate to ATP through aerobic respiration to replace the ATP stores that were depleted 
from the sarcoplasm because the conversion of pyruvate to ATP requires oxygen even after vigorous exercise ceases. There is an elevation in respiration and heart rate in order to convert that lactic acid to pyruvate and then that pyruvate to ATP. Some pyruvate is also used to replace the glycogen that was depleted during the exercise as well. Muscle fatigue is basically a reduction in the response of skeletal muscle fibers to nervous stimulation, typically following prolonged exercise. Muscle contraction may become progressively weak as exercise pro, uh, continues, and in extreme cases, muscle contraction can cease all together, even in the presence of nervous stimulation from motor neurons. Now, there are several causes of fatigue, but they're all related either directly or indirectly from the lack of sufficient ATP production from aerobic respiration to meet the needs of the skeletal muscle fiber for ATP. Because ATP is limiting, there are fewer calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in response to action potentials because ATP is required for the movement of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. There may also be a buildup of lactic acid as there is not sufficient production of ATP through aerobic respiration, there is an attempt by the cell to make up the difference by anaerobic respiration, which leads to a buildup of lactic acid. And as lactic acid levels in the sarcoplasm increase, that will decrease the pH. This results in changes in the shape of the myosin head, as well as the thin filament, which are both composed of proteins. And as you recall, protein is sensitive to changes in pH. After prolonged exercise, creatine phosphate levels are depleted. Glycogen can be depleted, both serving as sources of ATP. And in the motor neuron, there can be a decrease in release of acetylcholine because the production of acetylcholine as well as the release of acetylcholine requires ATP, and if there is a lack of ATP for the skeletal muscles, there will also be a lack of ATP for the motor neurons as well. All of these different occurrences can contribute to muscle fatigue. Before leaving ATP synthesis, I thought it was appropriate to mention that lipids can be used by skeletal muscle fibers to make ATP as well. In fact, when you're not exercising, such as now while you're viewing the screencast, most of the ATP being used by your muscle cells is actually obtained from lipids. Fatty acids are released from the breakdown of triglycerides. The fatty acids are then used by the mitochondria to make ATP using oxygen. In fact, one fatty acid can produce up to 120 ATP molecules. So let's now review the objectives of the screencast, explain why ATP is required for skeletal muscle fiber contraction, Describe the sources of ATP for skeletal muscle fiber contraction. Explain oxygen debt. List the components and explain the fate of lactic acid after exercise ceases. Explain muscle fatigue. The next screencast will cover the topic of exercise and the effects on muscles.